Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. We will be switching between Swedish and uh, English now, a little bit. So, hoppas att ni är förberedda på det. Uh, we have a very, very interesting uh, issue that we are going to talk about now. Government issued cryptocurrencies, the possibilities and the challenges. And I think this will be very interesting because of what we talked about in the beginning of this day also. What, what is happening in Bitcoin and what is happening in cryptocurrency in general. And we have three very interesting speakers and very different speakers because we would like to, to catch this trend and what's going on from three different angles. So actually we will start with the broader picture, what is going on in the world, what is happening in different parts of the world according uh, to this. Then we will focus down to what's happening here in Sweden. So we have one representative from Svenska Riksbanken that will talk about what is happening with the eKrona project. And then lastly we'll have a technical perspective from all the, the experience that uh, we nowadays have with, with Bitcoin and the challenges there compared to uh, government issued cryptocurrencies. What, what is the possibilities and problems there? So that's the three aspects we will cover. And afterwards, as I told you earlier today, we will have a question and answer session with all three speakers. So during the talk, please write down the questions and then we'll take all the questions afterwards. Is that okay? Good. And now we will start uh, with the, the world picture of what is going on. And we have a person that has actually built online banking and helped development teams building very interesting stuff in that area and have a good knowledge in the cryptocurrency space and what is happening there. So help me welcome on stage the CEO, CEO of Hive Online, Sophie Blackstad. Thank you very much. Thanks, Robert. Hello. Sorry, I don't speak Swedish. Um, I, I'm a, I look Swedish on paper, but um, I'm not. Um, it's, it's a family thing. Um, so, as Robert said, I'm the CEO of Hive Online. Um, we are a digital platform um, that is using cryptocurrencies in a way that is like central bank issue cryptocurrencies. So we're very, very interested in these and as a result um, are keeping a very close eye on what's going on in the world. Um, I've just come back from Singapore, the FinTech Fest there, um, where there's an awful lot of speculation about what's going to be going on in Southeast Asia, in particular China. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, my business model is about using cryptocurrency for practical purposes, um, for transactional purposes, um, but we're not a, a Bitcoin platform, so I'm not going to use the B word. Um, so, first off, Sorry, the clicker doesn't seem to be working. Oh, no, it is. Um, just a quick briefing on, on digital currencies. Um, before I start, I'm assuming that I've got a reasonably informed audience. Um, can I just have a quick show of hands as to who's got a cryptocurrency wallet of some sort? Okay, yeah, didn't, didn't think that it would be a, a novice audience. Right, so I'll, I'll skip over this then. Um, just basically to say that um, cryptocurrency is a type of digital currency which has various different characteristics, obviously using cryptography, um, but I don't think I need to tell you what that is. Um, there is a lot of speculation, however, and a lot of argument about whether a central bank cryptocurrency can truly be called a cryptocurrency in the sense that it's not Bitcoin, um, it's, not, it's not Ether. Um, it is something that is controlled to an extent. Now, from our perspective, we do regard central bank cryptocurrencies um, as cryptocurrencies because they use cryptography, because you've got public and private keys, um, because you've got ownership, because you've got most of the characteristics of a, a cryptocurrency. Um, but I'll just clear that up before we go into the, the speculation and the, the arguments, because I know that there's quite a lot of flame wars going on about that at the moment. Um, <coughs> so just to start off with the... Uh, 
Ah, thank you. The benefits. Um, now, as all of you know, or as most of you know, um, cryptocurrencies have many characteristics which are extremely useful for central banks. The key ones that we see are the lack of ability to double spend, um, and of course the traceability, um, the traceability and the auditability, which from a central bank perspective means that um, money laundering is much more difficult. Um, and of course we know that even today, um, with Bitcoin, I said I wasn't going to use the B word, but it sort of creeps in there. Um, even with Bitcoin, we can actually trace transactions because, of course, it's got all the characteristics of a cryptocurrency. Um, and as I'm sure many of you are aware, in Denmark, um, there have already been convictions for using Bitcoin to fund drug running in particular um, because of the traceability. So that is a hugely useful characteristic for central banks. Um, it could address, it can address tax evasion. Now, again, with a country like Sweden, where there is already a very high degree of digitization in the tax system, um, it's pretty difficult to avoid tax already. Um, but in many other countries, where there are very high ta cash economies, um, there is a big taxation issue for smaller companies and for the cash economy. Uh, you know, if we look across to Germany in particular um, and the UK, um, there are some very big um, black economy sectors using cash. Um, and of course, having a central bank digital currency means that there's greater usage of the, the digital cash of the cryptocurrencies um, and an e more ease to trace the, trace the tax. Um, <clears throat> but for me, one of the big things is, well, one of the big benefits for cryptocurrencies um, is actually outside of developed economies like this. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, because it means that because of the ownership structure, because you can carry cash on your wallet whether or not you have a bank account. In countries where there's a large unbanked population, it is extremely useful. So it promotes financial inclusion, it promotes the ability for unbanked or underbanked people to use national currency. And that is probably not a big thing here, but it's huge in other parts of the world. Um, from a central bank perspective, obviously it means you can control your interest rates. Um, and in the world of negative interest rates, um, that's a very interesting challenge. Um, at the moment, interest rates can't really fall below about minus a half or uh, minus one percent, depending on who you talk to, um, because once they go below a certain level, um, well, so the theory goes, we haven't actually seen this happening yet, um, but the idea is that people will start withdrawing cash and put it under the mattress because it won't depreciate so much. Um, of course, if you're controlling your digital currency, if you're effectively controlling the units of cash that people are using, um, you can still control your negative interest rates, um, which could be an interesting thing from a central bank perspective. Um, as I said, it removes the risk of dou double spending. And for me, the ownership thing is one of the key differences in that we're moving away from the balance in your bank account being a number that is stored within a bank's ledger to actual units of currency in your wallet which you can choose to spend at your discretion. Now that may not sound like a big thing, I mean I'm sure everyone's got, uh, sorry, can I just have a quick show of hands of who's got an Espresso House wallet on their phone? Oh, not many, okay. Um, but we all have little digital wallets which are holding amounts of digital cash. Today, those numbers, unless they're Bitcoin, but today those numbers are just numbers in somebody's ledger. But when you have cryptocurrencies, you are owning those units of currency which are on your phone or in your wallet, wherever that is. And that is a real, real big difference here. <coughs> um, and of course, it reduces the reliance on intermediaries and, and the cross-border costs. Um, I've said it here as an advantage that it could supplant the fractional reserve system, although that's potentially a big disadvantage for the commercial banking system. And I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, it could open up the opportunity for alternative lenders um, to enter the market um, and to start offering more competitive products, more competitive lending products based on, on the cryptocurrency. 
and it could remove the need for banks in the payment system. Now again, <clears throat> that may be an advantage for non-banking entities, it may even be an advantage for the central bank, um, but it's obviously not a great thing for the banks themselves, and that brings us on to the disadvantages. Ah, we go. <coughs> because of course, today, everyone, well, nearly everyone has a bank account. Why do we have bank accounts? Because without a bank account, you don't have access to your country's sovereign currency. The only way to access that currency today, or the only way to have a store of it today, um, electronically, is via a bank. Of course, you can carry around cash, but that has its limitations. Imagine a world where the central bank's digital currency is available to you um, securely, and electronically, and on your phone. Now, we believe that this has a, a significant potential impact in countries like Sweden, where there are a combination of factors. Um, first of all, the central bank, while they regulate the commercial banking industry, does not have control over the commercial banking industry. The commercial banking industry um, is not particularly popular with the general public. I think that's an not an unreasonable statement. Um, <clears throat> and you have a very highly technically aware general population. Now, with those combination of factors, there is every reason to suppose that a significant minority of the general population will choose not to engage with banks at all and not to have a bank account. And, of course, that re restricts the amount of money that's coming into the traditional banking system, um, and particularly in a country like Sweden, where the capital reserve requirements are very high on the traditional banks. That means it reduces the ability of those banks to issue money against the fractional reserve lending system, um, which could potentially restrict the flow of cash into the economy. Um, now, as I said on the previous slide, if we're seeing alternative lenders coming into the economy, that could actually just mean a rebalancing of the economy. <clears throat> but the real danger there is that banking in this economy is accountable for, what, 10% of the economy? Something like that. Um, and obviously disrupting 10% of the, the banking system, uh, sorry, 10% of the economy is potentially very significant. Um, now, we believe that banks have a part to play in a central bank-issued digital currency system, and there are plenty of examples of how this can work with banks as a sort of hub-and-spoke issuer, um, which can address that problem. Um, but there is also a, a central issuance model, which could potentially have a significant impact on the banks. And that's something that I know well, the central bank will talk about, um, because that is one of the big challenges that needs to be addressed, and, and is possible to address. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the same applies to reducing the, reliability, the reliance on banks as hubs for payments. Um, clearly, if you can make payments without going through your bank, that reduces a lot of the opportunities for banks to make profit, um, and again, potentially threatens the industry. Um, of course, we're seeing that today. Um, we're already seeing a lot of non-bank type payments going through. So again, it depends how you manage that. And in a country like Sweden, which is pretty sophisticated with its, the way it handles cash, that's probably not a big deal. But there are other countries where the switch from electronic payments through the banking system to a central bank digital currency issued payments could potentially have a significant impact. Um, <coughs> now, on the downside for people, um, some of the upsides for central banks are also potentially negative for the, for the population. Um, particularly the question about who decides on the rules. How are the rules decided? So you can control the interest rates, um, which as I said, if you've got negative interest rates, can potentially have a downside for the average consumer. Um, but more importantly, if you can control where your currency goes, which of course you can with cryptocurrencies, you can start programming in all sorts of behavioural rules. Um, and we deal with behavioural systems, so we know how easy that is to do. And as we've seen in China, and once you start programming behavioural rules into access to goods and services, you start getting a real big brother situation going on. Now, China hasn't yet issued its own digital currencies or its own cryptocurrencies, um, but it's already using these behavioural systems to um, control access to services um, and control how people's behaviour impacts their access to finance in particular. 
Um, and of course, the, uh, the full visibility of all transactions may not be popular with everyone. Um, now, in a country like Sweden, where people are um, pretty open with data, we don't see that that's a big challenge. Um, but in countries like Germany or the UK, um, where people are very, very worried about exposing their data, again, there could be challenges there. And I know that the Bank of England is, is very concerned about that particular aspect of it. Um, but something that I really wanted to emphasize that digital currencies or central bank digital currencies will bring to um, the people is the financial inclusion part. So we believe that developing economies will see more benefit than developed economies. Now, clearly there are benefits for developed economies. I've talked about those. But if we think about a country like Malaysia, where something like 80% of the population is unbanked, so they don't have access to a traditional bank account, and you have you know, plantations in Malaysia um, where people are paid every week by lorry loads of cash going out to the plantation. And you can imagine the sort of corruption that, that f just swarms around this sort of payments. So in countries like that, where most people don't have a bank account, but most people do have a phone, or even if you don't have a phone, you have access to a SIM card. Yeah? Um, as we've seen with M-Pesa in Kenya, um, communities have one phone and lots of SIM cards, and they keep their money, their digital wallets, on the SIM cards. Now, if you can do that with cryptocurrency, which is cryptographically signed and yours, you take out the middleman, you take out the lorry load of cash, you take out all of the corruption, or at least the majority of corruption in the system. That's a huge opportunity for cryptocurrencies. Um, so we believe that actually developing economies are likely to be some of the trailblazers in starting to issue digital currencies because the advantages are so significant um, and also because their regulatory barriers are quite a lot lower. Um, if you've got a real burning platform like you know, Somalia, for example, where your currency is completely out of control, um, your government is out of control, you have no kind of capital markets, you have no real kind of economy to speak of, um, then digital currencies or Central, central bank cryptocurrencies can solve an awful lot of these problems with stability, um, with exchange rates, and of course with access to cash. So we think that there is a significant opportunity there, and we think that's where a lot of the critical mass is coming from. <clears throat> However, where is it all going? So, as I say, I was out in Singapore last week, um, and something we've seen over the last few weeks and over the last few months is a lot of changes in China in particular and controls around cryptocurrencies and um, ICOs and how that's regulated. We believe that this is a precursor to China issuing its own cryptocurrency. Um, now, China has many of the right conditions. Its central bank, its regulator, its government and its commercial banking system are all very closely aligned, so it's easy to control. Um, and it has the widest use of e-wallets of any country in the world. Um, Alipay has 550 million customers, um, and they have moved from being an almost all-cash economy to being an almost all-digital economy in less than five years. Um, so there are all the right conditions in China, and we believe it's probably going to be one of the first countries to go, if not the first, although, of course, Dubai is al already doing a pilot, and then Russia has announced it's going to be piloting. So these countries are serious about it, and they're going to do it. We also think that the mass in Singapore will probably be an early adopter as well. Um, they've been looking at this for a long time. Um, they've had a lot of researchers on it. Um, and again, they've got all the right conditions of that, that centralized control um, from a central bank, from a, a regulator, government, and the banking system. So if you look at those countries, we think that those are all ones with the right conditions and the, and the right need. But we also think that developing economies are likely to be not very far behind, um, and particularly sub-Saharan Africa. We know that several sub-Saharan African countries have been experimenting to date, um, and as I said, they've got lower regulations and a burning platform need. So we think that Southeast Asia will probably drive the charge um, with the Middle East, um, but then sub-Saharan Africa will probably not be very far behind. Um, <clears throat> and then looking further forward, um, we think that there is a natural segue from a cryptocurrency issued by a nation. And of course, the challenge with cryptocurrencies is, you know, is it a cryptocurrency, isn't it? The whole notion of borderless currency comes in. 
So we think that we're going to start to see more block currencies coming up. I mean, obviously, we've already got the euro, we've got the dollar. Um, if we get China and other places issuing their own, then there is an opportunity to start using cryptocurrencies um, in a more liquid way, um, particularly things like the dollar, which is already used very extensively, for example, um, in countries where there's an unstable local currency. So we think that that will start to happen. And then we'll start to, we'll start to see more tokenization of assets um, and currencies that are based on things and behaviors um, rather than monetary policy. But that's in the future, and I don't really have time to talk about that. Um, so um, I'll just move on to, sorry. This clicker's not, oh, thank you. OK, um, <coughs> contact details. So. Yeah, we'll take some questions um, after the other presentations. Um, look forward to them. Thank you very much. It couldn't be better to focus down now on, on Sweden. And uh, we have a person that is very suitable for talk about that. We actually have um, one person from uh, Sveriges Riksbank. So welcome up on stage, Gabriella Geborg. Well, um, I'm Swedish, but I will keep to English. At least Sophie will understand what I'm saying. Although my English is kind of embarrassing after beautiful British English. So I'm sorry for that. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to talk about the eKruna project, which I suppose you have heard about. Uh, we have recently published a report about it at the Riksbank's website. Uh, that's a project where we the Riksbank uh, is studying the possibility of issuing digital currency. Why there would be a case, a reason for doing that? That's one of the main things that we have been analyzing. What kind of different models at the very conceptual level? Right now we are kind of technology neutral, so if you wanted to hear a lot about the B word, I'm not going to, to use it. Um, and if we decided to go ahead and issue, what are the possible implications on other areas of the central bank responsibilities, such as monetary policy and financial stability and, 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 what, and, and so on, that these issuance of digital currency could have? So before I begin to answer the first big question on why, uh, let me give you some his very interesting historical facts that you may no, not be aware of, uh, although may, most of you are Swedish, so maybe you know, but um, the first modern banknote was issued in the mid-1600s by a Swedish bank called Stockholm Banko. So that was the first modern bank note that was printed using the printing technology that was quite new. Um, this was a private bank, Stockholm Banco, and uh, it was quite a success. You can imagine people up to that point of time, they had to carry around lots of very heavy coins and all of a sudden they could use these very convenient bank notes. They issued too much, as banks tend to do, and they got into trouble, and they had to be saved by, by the Riksdag, right, by the parliament. That bank became the Riksbank, the first central bank in the world. So we were the first to actually issue modern banknotes. Um, oh, I've already gone to that. Um, so that's an historical fact that you can keep in mind that we were first in, 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 in this technological change in the mid-1600s. But when we speak about now this new technology, uh, central bank digital currency, as Sophie said, there is a question of definition. What do you mean? What do we mean by that? We have lots of discussions in the, in the international forum where we discuss with other central banks. Uh, as Sophie said, there are lots of pilots going on, lots of people talking about the issue. But strangely enough, there's no universally accepted definition of what a 
central bank digital CBDC, may I call it that, is. So let's start by how we see a central bank digital currency in Sweden at the Riksbank. So there is the definition. It's a national currency, precisely as Sophie said. What do I mean by that? It's denominated in the national currency. It's a kruna. Uh, it's nothing more than a kruna. It's digital, of course, it's electronic. Uh, if I stop there, you could say that central bank reserves, that is, banks, private banks' reserves at the central bank, are CBDCs already. So you have to add something more to the definition, and that something more is greater availability than to only the banks. So this would be electronic, sovereign, probably real-time, and besides all that, it would be available to the general public in the same way as banknotes and coins are today. So that's our definition of CBDCs. And as Sophie was saying, um, there are several central banks around the world and governments considering this issue, and there are very different reasons why they are considering it. They are considering because of, for example, in emerging markets, because of financial inclusion. It's great for financial inclusion. There are people talking about giving arguments for CBDCs from the monetary policy perspective. Uh, people talking about for or against from financial instability perspective, as, as you mentioned. Uh, from the Swedish perspective, the, the trigger is not that we're not thinking of these other things, because there are implications, but the trigger for us to analyze the issue is developments in the payment market in Sweden. And as I was saying, you know, cash, physical cash, is, is a product of a central bank. It's been a product of a central bank in Sweden for 350 years. Uh, we do it, we sell it to the banks, and the banks distribute it to the, to, the, to the retailers and to the general public. And cash, or money in general, um, have very important characteristics, three very important fun functions. It's a unit of account, you know, all prices are expressed in that unit of account. It's a store of value you can save in that currency, and it's a means of payment. And as a means of payment, all payments have something called network effects. I suppose you all know what I am talking about. You know, network effects is when you have a product or a service that the more people using or accepting that service or that product, the more useful it is for you to have it. And products or services having that characteristic of network effects usually show um, growth path that can be described as this uh, stylized S-curve, you know. When they are introduced in the market, they have very, very sluggish growth uh, until they get to an inflection point where they have critical mass of users. When they get there, then they grow very, very rapidly and uh, eventually they reach some point of maturity and, and, and uh, you know, so let, let me shift the picture now a little bit. Magic. Yes. Now this new blue curve here depicts, expresses cash in circulation in Sweden outside the banking sector. It can be a proxy for the demand for cash, the nominal demand for cash. Of course, this is a kind of a dramatical effect that I was trying to do because cash in the 50s, where the time series begin, was already a very mature payment instrument. What I wanted to show is that from around 2008, you see that the use of cash in Sweden, in absolute terms, began to decline extremely rapidly. We have had a decline in the use of cash of around 40% in eight, nine years. And that, although there are other countries in Europe, and especially in Nordic countries, that have very low cash usage, this uh, decline in the nominal use in absolute terms is unique for Sweden. And that's kind of boring. You see the dotted line there is not a forecast, it's just extrapolation. If the use of cash continues to diminish in the same way, uh, well, it's not far away that in, in the future that we will be without 
central bank money for the public. So we need to think, this is kind of central bank nerdy, so I can skip this one. Um, so we, we, we think that we are at the point that the issue of a cashless society may not be a theoretical, hypothetical issue any longer. We think it might be there very soon in Sweden. Uh, as I explained to you, cash and payments have network effects. They are also called two-sided markets. That means that you need to have two sides of the market on board for the payment instrument to be successful. For example, think of cards. You don't want to have a card in your wallet if it's not accepted everywhere by all retailers, and retailers would not want to pay fees for cards if they're not used by a very vast majority of consumers. So that's two-sided markets. So I explained how two-sided markets can grow over time. What I didn't explain is that the same dynamic can go the other way. So when the use of a certain payment instrument begins to decline and decline and decline and decline, and it gets to an inflection point where the critical mass of user is just too small, it quickly disappears in a death spiral. And we believe that we might be very close, if not already there. There are some researchers, payment researchers, um, Niklas Arvidsson, Jonas Hedman, and then one guy at the Central Bank, the Riksbank, uh, Bjorn uh, Segendorf, who are doing a research trying to get an answer to just that question. Um, they, they have a survey uh, with, um, a, I don't know, two, three thousand retailers asking the question, when do you think that you will stop accepting cash in Sweden? And here is their answer. Fourth of the Swedish retailers think that in 2020 they will not accept cash. And in 2025, it's seven years from now, 50% thinks they will not accept cash. So the issue of a cashless society is urgent for the Riksbank. And we think that it's at least our responsibility to give it a th serious thought and analyze whether we should or not issue a digital currency instead. So, because of networks effects, and I have explained how payments get introduced and adopted in the market very, very sluggishly, this will take time. Supposing that we are now just analyzing the issue, um, I can tell you that in next year, at the end of next year, the executive board at the Riksbank will decide whether to go on and launch the pilot and go on, or whether now we will wait a little bit. So suppose that they say, yes, go ahead, we will issue central bank digital currency. Because of the complexity of the project, because of networks effects, and so, so forth and, 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 and such, it will take time before it's fairly adopted in the market. So when we think about designing a central bank digital currency, we have to think about how do we think that the payment market, the retail payment market in, in, in particular, will look in, say, 10 years from now. So we can design something that can, you know, take care of the problems that may be there then. And what we see, we have, of course, we study the payment market all the time, but we published um, um, some analysis of the market a couple of years ago, the retail payment market in Sweden. And when we s what we see, what we said there was that we see now that there is some likelihood of fragmentation because of new regulation and new technology, new fintech and what, what and, 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 and what not. But in the medium term, we think that we will continue to see a large concentration of the payment market. Not at the service level to the end consumer, but the, at the infrastructure level, the pipes where the payments go. That's because economies of scale and networks effects, they tend to create very, very concentrated 
infrastructure systems. So we think that's the, the, the case it's going to be then too. Um, so what happens then if you have a very concentrated, it happens already now, if you have a very concentrated payment system, you have single points of failure. Is Suppose that something happened to the card network, Visa and MasterCard leaves the market. Uh, what then? Um, or the bank gyro, something happens there. What then? We don't have really alternative systems. Also, concentration gives problems in terms of efficiency because of lack of competition and barriers of entry to new entrants. So that are problems that we need to think about. We also see, and it's very much discussed, that there are some groups in society that are being hurt by this rapid digitalization. Um, it could be older people or it could be people with function variations, um, but they are hurt because they have less access to cash and they really cannot cope with them. Um, with the new electronic payment instruments. Those, of course, would not be helped by a new digital currency, but we could think of alternatives even for them. So what can a CBDC do? Well, I have already explained. The most important thing is that we would provide, continue to provide the function that we have been providing for 350 years, and that is a credit risk free asset and payment instrument to the public. You know, you think, well, we have deposit insurance and, and such, but when it's time of uh, financial stress, people really want to have central bank money. And we, we give the possibility, in that case, to the public to have access to that. Uh, that's not only a currency or a payment instrument, because in order for this to function, you need a whole infrastructure behind. Uh, and that infrastructure could give an alternative system. So you have a plan B, if something else in the private side fails, you have another infrastructure that can be used. The card system goes down, use the e-Kruna system instead. We also would have a platform that could be used as an access platform for new entrants where we could promote competition. And as I said, we could develop new functions, functionalities that could be used by people that have problems in adapting to the digital society. You know, easy to use cards or mobile applications. So, as if you have not read the, the, our publication, I um, recommend you to do it. Uh, but what we in this project recommend is that we, uh, if we issue, we issue um, a currency that will be a claim on the central bank, that is, the accounts are in the central bank and nobody, nowhere else. Uh, it will be available to the general public and companies. Uh, it will function um, in real time, 24-7. We are thinking of two models and a combination of two models. We will have, in that case, an account-based model. That means that all Swedes wanting to have, or all people living in Sweden wanted to have an account at the central bank, they will be able to do that. And think about the postal gyro, something like that. You have all you have accounts there and you can make transfers between accounts. Or the other alternative, uh, the combination, is that we have also a value-based something that you can download on your mobile or a card or something like that. Um, of course, it would be interesting to have, if we now issue this digital currency, to be able to use it as a monetary policy instrument, and Sophie explained why. Um, we think that because of legislation today, we may not be able to do that to, from the beginning. Uh, so we will not, in the beginning, if we have an ikruna, it will not be accrue interest rate. But we will build in the functionality so it will be possible for the ikruna to, to, to accrue interest rate in the future. 
So the role of the central bank in all this, if we do go ahead and issue a central bank digital currency, will be the traditional role of the central bank that is very limited. We issue, we withdraw from circulation, and we take care of the settlement between accounts. The rest, the processing of the payments, the, the contact with end users, that we hope will be done by the private side. Uh, cooperation with the banks and with the fintech and with the, you name it. Whoever wants to be interested will be there to provide the services. Well, um, I could talk about the impact on different aspects, but I don't think how much time do I have? One minute, so I will keep to the impact on the retail payment market. Um, we think because of what I said, network effects, banks have already incumbent advantages, and they have already exploited the network effect, they reach the whole market. So we think we don't have any you know, single killer pro property. We haven't thought about something that would be, you know, wow, everybody will want to have an ikruna. So unless we think about something like that, we think that we will, it will be very sluggish adoption pace. So it will take some time before an ikruna, in that case, get adopted. Um, and thus, it will not have a revolutionary effect on the payment market, nor in the business models of the banks to begin with. We think that the banks will find a new equilibrium. Um, however, we are aware of that if it is not adopted, if we don't find a way to get the general public to want to have accounts at the central bank or load an e -Kruna, then we cannot even uh, neither solve the other problems that we are intending to solve, we would be able to offer the public and, and, and um, central bank money. But we would not be able to offer an alternative payment system to avoid single point of failure. Uh, we would not be uh, able to offer a platform for competition. So that's a very hard thing to, to consider. So my time is out and I will be happy to answer questions after the panel. Thank you. Tack så jättemycket. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, okay. So, now I will switch back to Swedish and we will start the technical aspect of uh, this session. So, vi ska ha en uh, liten teknisk analys av situationen och uh, en del av de problem som jag vet flera har funderat på hur man ska kunna lösa och vilka möjligheter som finns. Och eh, vad är då bättre än att ta hit en av dem som är de skarpaste på den här biten. Så välkommen fram Alexander på tema. Ja, jag kommer antagligen att ställa mer frågor än svar. För att det här är någonting som jag har funderat över under en längre tid, hur kan man egentligen få en e-krona säkert? Därför att när jag kom i kontakt med bitcoin så förstod jag på en gång att det här är 100% säkert. Men kan en centralbank göra någonting likadant så att det blir lika säkert? Vad menar man med säkerhet? Vi börjar med att definiera det. Och vilken sorts nivå av säkerhet vill vi ha på en e-krona? Och då kan man säga att om man har några servrar någonstans stående så brukar man ju ha någon form av brandvägg som ser till att otillbörliga personer inte kommer in i systemet. Det problemet är faktiskt ganska svårt att lösa, bara där. Men det är inte omöjligt. Jag tror att ingen har lyckats byta sig in i mina servrar som jag har hemma. Men jag kan ju inte vara helt säker på det. Men jag tror det i alla fall. Tänk nu istället att Riksbanken anställer en elak administratör på insidan. Så att det är en administratör som har onda avsikter. Då blir det ännu svårare säkerhetsproblem. Och sen finns det en tredje, nämligen att de där två kommunicerar med varandra. Så man har en skurk på utsidan och en skurk på insidan som har förmågan att kunna manipulera systemet. Då får man faktiskt ett väldigt svårt säkerhetsproblem att lösa. Så jag brukar säga, 
Vi ska skydda er mot yttre hot, vi måste skydda oss från insiders och vi måste skydda oss från både insiders som samarbetar med någon från utsidan. Det är ett jättesvårt säkerhetsproblem att lösa. Jag tror jag aldrig någonsin har sett någon lösa det här problemet. Om man då tänker sig att vi har ett vad, vad, vad liksom 100% säkerhet, det har jag redan nämnt, då vet jag att det innebär att den ska klara av att detektera insidan, utsidan och insidan och utsidan kombinerat. Och jag har redan nämnt att... Eh, ja, nu gick jag händelsen här förväg. Det man också måste tänka på med 100% säkerhet är att mjukvara kan man manipulera. Man måste utgå ifrån att det kan hända. Man måste dessutom utgå ifrån att hårdvara kan också vara manipulerad. Allting som kan manipuleras måste man förutsätta att det kan hända. Speciellt om en hel nations valuta står på spel så vill man inte att det här ska kunna inträffa. Hur vet man att en dator är manipulerad då? Går det att ta reda på? Övervakningsdatorer som man har kan också manipuleras. Så det blir liksom en hönan och ägget. Hur man än bär sig åt så kommer man alltid att kunna se till att manipulera tillräckligt mycket för att det inte ska synas att det är manipulerat. Kryptografi hjälper inte. Krypto privata nycklar, allt det här, det kan läcka. Det är inga problem att stjäla privata nycklar om man verkligen vill göra det. Och hur skiljer man en administratör som faktiskt administrerar systemet som det är tänkt att användas från en infiltratör som faktiskt har onda avsikter? Det går inte att se skillnad. En dator kan inte se skillnad mellan de här två personerna. Så hur ska man liksom sköta det här? Och det, anledningen till det att en dator inte kan se skillnad på de här personerna det är ju att när en människa interagerar med en dator så är det någon form av utbyte i elektronisk form som gör att jag tror att datorn gör det jag säger åt att den ska göra men jag kan inte vara helt säker. Om man tänker sig då att man har så kan man lösa det här med massa kopior, att man har en massvis med kopior av samma information. Då kan man ju tänka sig då att eh, vi har massvis med databaser utspridda på massa olika ställen. Kanske en till och med i riksdagen och en i riksdagshuset och så vidare. Och då kan vi ju detektera ganska enkelt om en av de här kopiorna skiljer sig åt. Och det är ju inget stort problem att lösa. Men problemet är att om man faktiskt vill göra en ändring i den här databasen. Så vi har samma databas, samma mängd information och så vill jag göra den här ändringen. Då vill jag ju skicka den ändringen till de andra databaserna. Så att, att bara ha många kopior löser inte problemet. För att den fråga vi ska ställa oss det är vilka ändringar ska vara tillåtna. Och den, det måste ha svar på den frågan. För har du inte svar på den frågan så är inte systemet säkert. Och hur skyddar vi då oss från otillåtna ändringar i databasen? Varför jag sitter och pratar om det här, det är liksom Riksbankens e-krona, det är alltså alla peng, sedlar och mynt i princip i hela nationen. Skulle man någon kunna manipulera det här systemet så skulle den personen kunna bli väldigt rik och naturligtvis använda sina pengar och spendera dem på ett sådant sätt så att inte Riksbanken kan reversera transaktionen. Klassiska exemplet är vad som hände i Bangladesh med centralbanken. På deras utländska valutor så använder man ganska snabbt så placerar man de här utländska valutorna i pokersajter på nätet eller någonting och sen så är det omöjligt att reversera den transaktionen. Så Bangladesh blev faktiskt av med väldigt mycket av sina dollarreserver. Och så hur definierar man en otillåten ändring i det här systemet och hur ska man detektera det? Och då finns det ett svar på den frågan. Och det var det här som Bitcoin löste 2009 eller 2008 om man då vill mena när det här pappret skrevs. Som gjorde att Bitcoin är en revolutionerande teknik. För de löste det här problemet. Och det löste man med hjälp av något som heter konsensus. Vad är konsensus för någonting? Det är regler som talar om vad som är tillåtet att göra. Och de här reglerna kan inte ändras. För om de skulle ändra, kunna ändras, ja, då, de, då går det inte att verifiera att reglerna fälls. Och om man har en fast uppsättning regler, då kan 
oberoende parter verifiera att reglerna följs. Och det är det som är den revolutionerande aspekten med kryptovalutor, är att man kan göra det här. Och det är därför kryptovalutorna är säkra. Annars hade inga kryptovalutor hade funnits överhuvudtaget, därför att det skulle ha gått några månader och sen så hade de här serverna blivit hackade och sen så kryptovalutan värdelös. Kryptovalutor fungerar på grund av det här. Och det här är det som är decentralisering. Och då ser man enast ett problem, att det här kan ju inte en centralbank använda sig av. Därför att det är ju en centralbank, inte en decentralbank. Om man tar fortsättning på konsensus. Konsensus det är en tvångströja. För det är väldigt jobbigt att ha såna här regler som inte kan ändra på sig. De ger fantastisk säkerhet. Men det blir väldigt jobbigt att göra ändringar om man nu vill göra de här ändringarna. Och om har man då en egenskap som inte har konsensus, man vill lyfta ut en egenskap ur den här regelsamlingen, då kan inte vi garantera säkerheten längre. Och det här tar några, det här tar tid att tänka på att verkligen funderar man riktigt djupt på det här så inser man precis att säkerheten kan inte garanteras om det inte följs av en konsensusregel. Så, hur skapar vi då nya pengar? För en centralbank, e-kronan, vill ju kunna öka penningmängden. Det är ju hela deras uppgift i ett sådant system. Ska det vara konsensus, ja då är det väldigt säkert. Men det kan inte en centralbank ha. För att då kan vi inte kontrollera penningmängden. Utan konsensus, ja då kan otillåtna pengar skapas. Och det vill vi inte, för då kan ju någon berika sig. Och då är frågan, ska e-kronan vara konsensusbaserad eller inte konsensusbaserad? Oavsett vad man väljer så blir det inte riktigt bra. Så därför är det ganska problematiskt. Kan man kombinera det här då? Så att vi tar någonting, vi tar inte riktig konsensus som, som det är i bitcoin, att man aldrig någonsin ändrar reglerna. Utan man gör någon slags medelväg, att vi ändrar konsensus ibland. Och då kan man tänka sig att ja, om intervallen är för korta, då har vi inte konsensus. Då, då är det samma sak som... Då kan, man inte då kan inte oberoende parter verifiera att reglerna följs, som reglerna hela tiden ändrar på sig. Det blir, det blir väldigt svårt att hänga med. Och har man väldigt korta intervall med mycket regler som byts ända tiden, då kan en infiltratör gå in där och snika in bland de här regeländringarna, därför att det blir så slentrianmässigt att reglerna hela tiden ändrar på sig. Kan man ha långa intervall då? då? Säg eh, trög konsensus kallar jag det för. Konsensus då nya eh, ändring då nya pengar skapas. Till exempel var tredje år. För tittar man på en centralbank, när de skapar nya pengar med penningpressen så har de ett lag, de skapar ju massa pengar så har de ett lager och så distribueras de här kontanterna ut till bankerna, till bankomater. Eh, men problemet är att under den här treårsperioden så är de här... Eh, pengarna i det elektroniska valvet, de går att stjäla. Eller om de inte går att stjäla så går de att förstöra av en insider. Därför att man kan skicka ut nycklarna på, på, på nätet och säga här är, här är nycklarna till de här pengarna. Och då blir det väldigt jobbigt för centralbanker, för då kan de inte ge ut några pengar på tre år. Eller, eller så blir det någon slags larmberedskap där man måste komma fram till någon ny konsensus med ny radioutsändning till publiken och så talar man om att ja, men nu är det de här nycklarna som gäller och i det momentet så är det ju väldigt sneaky för då kan en insider kopiera de privata nycklarna precis i det tillfället så att han kan göra samma sak en gång till. Och det är inte bra. Så under den här, alltså har man lång Långa intervall på konsensus, då är det hög risk för stöld. Har man korta intervall på konsensus, då är det inte konsensus. Då tänker man sig så här, när man pratar inom, inom med, med elektroniska pengar så de, de flesta de tänker inte i konsensus, de har inte kommit så långt än, utan de tänker bara i termer av publika och privata nycklar. Och det har vi ju idag massvis med publika och privata nycklar för att kunna lösa alla möjliga aspekter. Men vi har inte använt publika och privata nycklar för att skydda pengar. För incitamentet att stjäla privata nycklar är enormt om jag kan veta att jag kan bli väldigt rik på det. 
Om man har flera stycken som signerar skulle det gå att lösa. I Riksbanken så har vi en delegation på fem stycken riksdagsbanksledamöter. Säg att de fem har varsin penna, digital penna, som kan signera någon digital check med som är det elektroniska valutan som ska skapas. Problemet är bara, hur vet man att de här nycklarna verkligen är äkta? Det är jättesvårt att veta. Du, en, 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 om man lär, lär sig eh, slumptal på en dator så får man lära sig att det finns väldigt enkla slumptalsgeneratorer på en dator. Du kan inte se skillnad mellan den, det och äkta slump. Så hur kan jag veta att inte någon har planterat en trojan på den här datorn som ser ut att producera slumpmässiga nycklar men egentligen är de inte det? De är mitt lösenord med något siffra efter. Så att jag kan ta de pengarna när de väl försöker använda dem. Hårdvara kan manipuleras. Det är, den som gör hårdvaran kan ju bli mutad så att den inte slumpar. För att det ser ut som att det är slumpmässiga nycklar, men egentligen så är det inte det. Leverantör kan manipuleras. Den som ska leverera hårdvaran byter ut det mot en annan dosa när det ska skickas till centralbanken. För man, man får ju tänka på att de här doserna, om man nu skulle ha hårdvarulösningar, de... De går ju sönder och batteriet tar slut och så vidare. De måste ju kunna bytas ut. Så att det blir ju en svag punkt. Och leverans kan manipuleras. Så det, det är mycket att tänka på. Det är jättesvåra frågor att, att lösa det här. Men min generella åsikt är att man kan inte lita på privata nycklar och, och publika nycklar. Det, kan, det kommer alltid att kunna läcka. Och därför måste man, och då, då, så Bitcoin-nätverket är inte skyddat av privata nycklar. Extremt viktigt att förstå det, utan det är skyddat av konsensus. Enskilda personer kan bli bestulna av bitcoins. Det är när privata nycklar läcker, och det är precis det som händer. Hänt många gånger. Så, vägvalet tycker jag då. då. Nu är jag väldigt eh, burdus här och säger att ja, nu det ena hållet går inte. Riksbanken som... Eh, Sades nyss av föregående talare så har man två stycken modeller som man utvärderar. Den ena kallar man för värdebaserad e-krona och det vill säga att det är inte kopplat till någon person utan det kan bara by det kan byta ägare utan att man liksom behöver veta vilka som är avsändare och vilka som är mottagare. Det brukar jag kalla för anonym e-krona. Och det är ett väldigt problematiskt med en anonym e-krona därför i det här kontextet med den här säkerhets säkerhetsmässiga aspekten så om man skulle välja den anonyma vägen så kan man inte återställa om det blir fel. För då förstör man en av de viktigaste egenskaperna för pengar och det är nämligen något som heter fungibility. På svenska, om man översätter det, så betyder det utbytbarhet. Om jag håller mina pengar, då måste jag veta att de här pengarna går att använda. Annars kommer jag tappa tilltron till det, till det finansiella systemet om, min, om mina pengar plötsligt blir värdelösa för att det blir någon bugg hos hos systemet, att man har dragit tillbaka pengar som man trodde tillhör, tillhörde en terrorist, men det var någon annans helt oskyldig persons pengar. Kontobaserat då, det är den andra vägen att gå. Om man är identitet per konto, det är också faktiskt ganska knepigt. Det var ganska intressant, för jag har haft många debatter med massa olika personer om det här området och fick mig att tänka till ett varv till, för jag trodde liksom att Anonyma pengar, det går inte. Det, det, det kommer inte att funka. Men kanske är det så att kontobaserat funkar. Och då var det faktiskt i den här debatten så fick man tänka till att ja, det går nog inte heller. Därför att det som är bra med kontobaserat det är att man kan återställa vid ett domstolsbeslut. Alltså, du kan inte återställa anonyma pengar därför att då riskerar man pengars fungibility och det vill man inte. Men kontobaserat, då kan man ju faktiskt ta reda på vilka som är de skyldiga och så, så återställer man balanserna och sen är allting färdigt. Problemet är att en insider kan skapa fejkkonton. Det går ju inte att veta att en identitet på centralbankens databas verkligen är en person i det riktiga livet. För att en administratör på en insidan kan skapa nya konton som inte har någon tillhörighet och sen kan han använda de här kontorna och skicka pengar till ett pokersajt och sen så kassar man ut sin vinst den vägen. Det är väldigt svårt. Så det är nästan lika svårt att återställa ändå. Det var ingen större skillnad mellan anonyma pengar. Så min slutsats är att jag kan inte se en lösning på de här problemen. Och det är möjligt att det finns en lösning på problemet. Jag har grundat på det här ett par år. Men det kanske finns någon som hittar på en klyftig idé. Men jag ser den inte just nu. 
Så det är egentligen det jag skulle vilja säga att om Riksbanken funderar på att verkligen praktiskt implementera nya krona, då måste de tänka på att insiderattacker måste man verkligen se till att de inte går att genomföra, för annars kommer de att genomföras. För att när det är mycket pengar på spel, då kommer de här insiderattackerna att komma. Det kan jag garantera. Om jag kan bli, kanske, det kommer alltid finnas någon person som är villig att ta den risken om man får 10 miljarder kronor eller någonting sånt. Så det är ett svårt problem att lösa. Men det var allt jag hade tänkt att säga.